Let's go ahead and get started. Before we do, however, um, probably most of you know that the chances of having class on Monday are relatively low, um, given all of the predictions for lots of snow. Um, if that is the case, I will be recording the lecture and posting it online. So that will be available, because otherwise, given 10 weeks of the term and the amount of material that we cover, um, that would probably not be a really good thing. Of course, there will not be clicker questions, but if anything comes up during one of those lectures, again, please email me, and I will post any answers to questions on D2L in the discussions and question section, which I've been doing, and I know some people have been looking at them, but certainly not everyone. Um, and hopefully, today again, all the technology will work. We shall see. Uh, before I did get, want to get started, though, um, I've had a number of requests for a table like this before. Basically, all that this is is sort of comparing between bacteria and eukarya, the different proteins of the replication fork. And the main thing here is this bizarre different terminology. So RPA that you have in eukaryotes instead of the single-stranded binding protein, PCNA versus the beta clamp, et cetera. Everything that's in red are the ones that are different between the two. So Paul alpha primase, you have just in eukaryotes, you don't have it in bacteria. And DNA polymerase one, you don't have in eukaryotes, but you do have in bacteria. Fen one, on the other hand, you have in eukaryotes and you don't have in bacteria. So this is a, again, quick review, hopefully useful for that next exam, which is coming along. Also wanted to review mismatch repair really briefly because I zoomed through it right at the end of last lecture. Uh, basic message here is that polymerases are pretty darn good, mostly because they're, again, they're checking the structures of base pairs as they're replicating, adding nucleotides, but they make mistakes. Most of those mistakes get taken care of by the proofreading activity, the backing up activity, the three prime to five prime exonucleus activity, but still there are mistakes. Mistakes are made is maybe one way of putting it. And so the first way that that gets dealt with is with mismatch repair. And mismatch repair, as we're gonna hear many, many times now, detects problems by shape not by actual identity of any given nucleotide. So if there's a problem with the base pair because it's the wrong base which got added, then the mismatch repair machinery will recognize that. And once it's been recognized by this protein called mute S, then it interacts with another protein, mute L, and this mute L protein will look for a nick that's in the newly made strand. Why the newly made strand? Because that's the strand that the polymerase has put the wrong nucleotide into. So you need to get rid of that newly made strand. That can either be due to the fact that you're in E. coli and you have hemimethylated DNA. So the old DNA is methylated, new DNA is not. That's what this mute H protein does. It'll put a nick in this strand. If your eukaryotic cells, there are lots of nicks because the Okazaki fragments are relatively short in the lagging strand, and turns out in the leading strand as well, DNA polymerases don't always completely manage to replicate that new strand. So there are always nicks. Nick here, then a second nick is made right next to where you have this mismatch, again, all on this new strand, the red strand. Once you have a piece of DNA that's been nicked to both ends, then you have a DNA helicase that gets rid of it. And now we have a 3 OH and a template and lots of DNA polymerases in the cell. That gets repaired by normal DNA synthesis. So that process will repair your mismatch, but it also makes a lot of extra DNA in the process. And it copies all of this, so it's a relatively inefficient mechanism for repairing DNA because you're repairing a big chunk of DNA as opposed to just repairing the one change that happens. So it turns out that DNA repair also does these single changes. 
That's what's called base excision repair, as well as a nucleotide excision repair here that we'll get back to in just a second. So base excision repair is sort of the opposite of what happens with this mismatch repair, and as we'll see with nucleotide excision repair. Base excision repair is a very efficient mechanism which literally just changes the one nucleotide which has a problem. The way that works is that single nucleotides that have a problem are recognized. In this case, it's deaminated cytosine, so you have a uracil. Uracil is not normally in DNA. So there are recognition mechanisms, proteins, that specifically recognize if there's a uracil in DNA. That recognition protein also has a enzymatic activity. It will remove the uracil from that position. Once you have a removed uracil, now you just have the ribose together with the phosphodiester backbone, and you can call this an AP site. Now, what's AP? It's apurinic or apyridemic, so either one. Just an abasic site would be another way to talk about it. But people use this in AP. AP endonuclease. What do endonucleases do? They cut in the middle of DNAs. So AP site, chop the DNA. OK? That's been cut. Now you have a phosphodiesterase. So again, ACE enzyme, what does it do? It cuts a phosphodiester bond. In that process, you lose one phosphate one sugar, the base is already gone. Now you have a 3 prime OH, a template, and a DNA polymerase can fill in this base. And then you have a DNA ligase that can hook it back together. Now, again, unlike the case for base excision repair, and sorry, for mismatch repair, and as we'll see for nucleotide excision repair, this is, again, it's extremely efficient. It's a single base that gets chopped out and put back in. There's a very big problem with this, and that is you have to recognize that specifically changed base. So this is only going to work for the very common kinds of chemical damages that you have to DNA. So deamination of cytosine, depurination, now, any of these things that are very common, you can afford, again, to totally over-anthropomorphize here, evolving a protein that's very specific for taking care of that one problem. On the other hand, if you have other bizarre changes that are potentially happening less frequently or are pretty variable, and I like the example of the pyrimidine dimer here. Last time we talked about photolyases, which will repair Permitting dimers, but mammals have, for whatever reason, again, evolutionarily speaking, have lost this activity. So permitting dimers can be TT, they can be CC, they can be CT, etc. Lots of different, relatively lots of different kinds of things you can have. And so the way that cells deal with these kinds of changes, and particularly human cells, and other bulky, big changes that are actually often relatively rare is that this changes the structure of the DNA, and the repair machinery recognizes that there's a structural problem, not unlike mismatch repair, and says, okay, we're going to chop this piece that contains this problem out and repair the whole thing. So the way that this is done, you have nucleases, endonucleases now that will cut on either side of where this problem is. Again, recognized because of the structure. A DNA helicase will remove this strand that has this problem in it. And then you've got a 3 prime OH, a template. DNA polymerase can fill this back in. And you have a DNA ligase that fills it in at the end here. We'll look at these in a little bit more detail in the next couple of slides. First one is deamination. And deamination, again, is one of those most common right after depurination. Deamination 
We already talked about this one. Cytosine deamination goes to uracil. Again, one of the most common forms. Uracil, not normally present in DNA. And as all of you, I'm sure, remember, because you haven't wiped it from your brains after the last midterm, the structures of adenine and guanine also have these amine groups on them. They can also be deaminated by exactly the same reaction, hydrolysis, giving unnatural amino acids. And we say unnatural amino acids, these are not naturally found in DNA. So if you have a protein that can recognize hyposanthine or xanthine, then the cell knows there's been deamination that's happened here. That's a nucleotide that we want to cut out. Once it's been cut out, we have an AP site that can then go through the rest of the base excision repair process. One problem, again, hopefully not to be beating the dead horse, if you have 5-methylcytosine methylated on this position, deamination gives you thymine. Thymine is a problem because you don't want to have a protein that recognizes thymine in DNA and chops it out because that's what would happen with all of the other thymines. This is true in general. Um, in practice, it turns out there actually are enzymes that will recognize a guanine bound to a thymine and repair that thymine specifically because the deamination of 5-methylcytosine is clearly a problem. But in general, there's no enzyme that will just go through and chop out thymines, whereas there are enzymes that will chop out uracil, there's those that chop out xanthine, and those that will chop out hyposanthine. This is actually a little strange, if you think about it, because these chemical changes happened while they're base paired inside the DNA. But somehow, a protein has to recognize that there's been a change that's happened right there inside your double-stranded DNA. So what actually happens is that these enzymes that are looking for all of these changes, uracil, xanthine, hyposanthine, actually literally pull out the bases one by one throughout the whole genome and are checking them. And basically, this is a constant process. There's constantly screening through all of the DNA to see if, for instance, uracil has been incorporated into DNA. This still blows me away, that there are proteins literally scanning along the DNA all the time looking for any kind of problem. And we know from X-ray crystal structures that this is what happens. These bases get flipped out and can be recognized by these proteins, again, that are looking for these specific changes. This is actually one of those enzymes are in gray. Here's the DNA in purple, and then the modified base here in red. And so, and this will now again get chopped off um, by this glycosylase. In the case of the uracil DNA glycosylase, this is just cartooned down here. The uracil in the DNA, the glycosylase will cleave the glycosidic bond from the one prime position of the ribose to the base. Now you have an AP site. AP endonuclease will cut right here. There's an exonuclease, or the phosphodiesterase, that will remove the one ribose and phosphate. And then you've got a 3 prime OH that the polymerase can extend and fill this back in. So that's the process for nucleotide excision repair. And again, it's all dependent on one enzyme that recognizes a specific modified base or recognizes that there's no base present here at all. So in depurination, you end up with this no base at all under these kinds of conditions. Nucleotide excision repair depends on structure. And so if there's a problem with the structure, a distortion in your DNA double helix, then there are proteins that associate with it. This has best been studied in E. coli. How do you get these kinds of pyrimidine dimer formation? How do you get them? Usually, 
And what's one of the problems that we don't have to deal with too much in Portland? Light, exactly. UV irradiation. So, UV irradiation causes the formation of pyrimidine dimers. UVR, UV radiation, are mutants in E. coli that are hypersensitive to UV radiation. So, that's how they identified the proteins which are involved in this process. And it's not just UV irradiation, it's any of these distortions that happen in the DNA. Pardon me. Um, so, happen, distortions that happen in the DNA bound to by these UVR proteins. A, B, C, and D are not important. Don't memorize those num uh, letters. They will bind to DNA. There's ATP hydrolysis. This UVR protein will bring in an endonuclease again that will cut on either side of wherever this change is. A DNA helicase will get rid of this. And 3'OH, DNA polymerase, will repair through there. So that's basic excision repair, nucleotide excision repair. Last time we talked about the basic excision repair um, and mismatch repair, also photolyase. What the heck was photolyase? Photolyase helps fix these pyrimidine dimers if you're in a cell that happens to have that enzyme. We don't. Uh, but it's a much more efficient process because instead of, again, cutting out a big chunk of DNA and resynthesizing it, it literally just repairs that one change which has happened. So these are the basic kinds of repair. We'll talk about a couple more in just a second, but one of the things that's really important, again, DNA damage is happening all the time, is you want to repair some parts of your DNA sooner than other parts of your DNA. And this is a great example that we know of in the human genome, right? Human genome, 3 billion base pairs in the haploid genome, 1.5% of that is protein coding. So, which kinds of DNA damage do you want to repair more? The coding sequences as opposed to the non-coding sequences. How do you do that? Well, one of the easy ways to do that is to have repair coupled to something else. And when I say the something else, particularly when we're talking about protein coding sequences, that something else is transcription and the transcriptional machinery. So what that means is the RNA polymerase brings along with it or helps bring the repair proteins to places in the DNA where repair needs to happen. So what happens is you have a polymerase, and it turns out this also happens a little bit with the DNA polymerases, but more so with the RNA polymerases, is you have RNA polymerase happily transcribing along, making RNA, and then it bumps into something that it can't deal with. When that happens, there's signaling which says, hey, time to bring in these nucleotide excision repair proteins and deal with this problem. Now, in the case of E. coli, there's not a direct interaction here. In eukaryotic cells, and we'll talk much more about this when we talk about the RNA polymerases later, there's something called the C-terminal domain. It's a big, long piece that hangs off the back of the RNA polymerase. That literally binds to a lot of DNA repair proteins. And so these DNA repair proteins are literally brought along for the ride with the DNA polymerase. And it turns out this coupled repair can be base excision repair, or in this case, as we can see, it's the nucleotide excision repair process. Questions on this? And he says this, what do you time to you? Yes? So the, the question is, why do you not need, and I'll paraphrase here, why do you not need a primase? So why do you not need a primase? What? There's already DNA, and what's most important about that DNA? What are you really looking for? What does the DNA polymerase need? It needs a template and it needs a primer, but what thing, part of that about that primer? 3'OH. 
So as long as it's a 3 prime OH, it doesn't matter if it's DNA or RNA or whatever. The polymerase is perfectly happy. It can bind to that and extend. So you do. So in that case, as long as you've got a 3 prime OH there that's next to a template, you don't need any extra primase. Okay, now we're inside time to get their clickers out, right? <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> the mechanism of mismatch repair is most similar to the mechanism of which of the following? Photoreactivation, which is photolyase, nucleotide excision repair, basic excision repair, proofreading, or transcription coupled repair. It's time for me to have some topoisomerase activity. Still no consensus. Talk amongst yourselves. Go again? Yes. Let's do it. Oops. This will actually start. Here we go. Yeah. Again, continue to discuss this. This is fine. You get extra, extra minute. this question. A couple of people come and ask me about um, exams, how to do well on exams. When you're looking at questions, uh, be very careful what you're looking for. In this case, the key word is mechanism. In fact, I've repeated it twice. So the actual mechanism, which is finding a change in the structure of the DNA, exonuclease activity around the difference in that structure of DNA, resynthesis of a big piece. And so that gives us what? <laughs> B, so nucleotide decision repair. So both the same way. There's a structural change in DNA, endonuclease activity around it, helicase activity, as opposed to a single nucleotide being removed. Yes, there is just one nucleotide change, but in mismatch repair, 
These are correct nucleotides, so you don't have a specific enzyme that says, I'm going to cut out a cytosine or guanine, because mismatch repair is only with the normal bases that are getting added. OK, I wanted to <clears throat> move on. These, all these mechanisms are great. Mismatch repair, base excision repair, nucleotide excision repair, because of this wonderful aspect of DNA is you've got that backup copy on the other side. On the other hand, double strand breaks are a much bigger problem. Because if you cut both strands, where do you put it back to? You don't know where it needs to be hooked back to. So how do you get double-stranded breaks? Um, ionizing radiation, x-rays, et cetera, and we talked about this before. Um, radiation oncology, people use this. Also, chemotherapy drugs, many chemotherapy drugs lead to double-stranded breaks. Um, double-stranded breaks are a real problem. And so you're trying to kill off the cells, again, when you're trying to do chemotherapy this way. Probably most double-stranded breaks that happen normally um, during normal cellular growth, not the uh, time when you're irradiating it, is during DNA replication. And so there are a lot of nicks that happen in your DNA, and we talked about this and using it for how you decide which is the new strand, which is the old strand, when you have DNA replication in eukaryotes. So if you have a nick on one strand, and then you try and replicate past that nick, you end up generating a double-stranded break. And we'll look at that in just a second. So probably most of the double-stranded break repair that happens in general is going to be dealing with problems that have happened due to replication. There are basically two ways to deal with double-stranded breaks. There's the quick and dirty way, also known as non-homologous adjoining, or the much more slow and specific way, um, which is homologous recombination. Um, and I should mention here, actually, I've got the telomeres, not substrates, down here as a subset for homologous recombination. But telomeres actually are not substrates for double-stranded break repair. And this is actually really important because telomeres have a double-stranded end. So how does the cell know that this is not something that needs to be repaired and hooked up to something else or with non-homologous end joining or homologous recombination? And a lot of those extra proteins that are involved with the telomere and the T-loop structure are there because you don't want double-stranded break repair to happen on telomeres, on telomeric ends. <clears throat> Double-stranded breaks um, can lead to cancer, but you can also use them for chemotherapy. So it's kind of a fine line between the two. How do you deal with double-stranded breaks? Um, again, can't use that other strand, but at least for all of us and most eukaryotic cells, we're diploid. Or sometimes even more than that if you're fortunate enough to be a plant. Um, or a frog, um, but <clears throat> you have multiple copies of not identical chromosomes, but at least homologous chromosomes. So some extra information that can be used, and that's where we get to homologous recombination. So let's look at an overview of what these things look like. Um, Non-homologous end joining, again, the quick and dirty mechanism. You have a double-stranded break that happens. What happens in non-homologous end joining? These ends get chewed up. You end up with then blunt ends, again with no overhang, and these ends get smashed back together. Again, it's quick, but it's dirty because you end up losing some nucleotides in this process. And a lot of you have heard of maybe about CRISPR, clustered, regulate, interspersed, palindromic repeats. No one remembers that that acronym is for. Uh, but CRISPR, what CRISPR does, CRISPR-Cas is make double-stranded breaks. And the way that most, at least the original CRISPR-Cas uh, gene mutations were done, double-stranded breaks, non-homologous end joining, this makes a mutation in your gene. So if it happens to be in a protein coding sequence, this can be a real problem. But if you've got lots and lots of double-stranded breaks, then this may be the way that you can do it. And this is also possibly why our genome has so much junk in it. So if you have a double-stranded break in junk, you can afford to get rid of a couple of those nucleotides. So sort of a, a buffering way um, to think about that. And then homologous recombination, 
instead of putting these two ends back together, it's repaired from the homologous chromosome or sister chromatids for getting that back. So let's look at the overall process, non-homologous end joining. Again, you have a double-stranded break that happens. This double-stranded break is bound to a protein called KU. Again, not important to remember what that is. Um, it binds to a protein called DNA protein kinase, which not surprisingly is a kinase, and it will interact with both DNAs and proteins. Um, this phosphorylation process brings more proteins to this point, which both chew in the ends and put them back together. Now, this is, again, what happens, the quick and dirty mechanism. It's great for repairing DNA, but it turns out that this almost identical process with the KU protein and DNA protein kinase is also involved in making antibodies. So the different domain joining making antibodies, and part of the reason that our immune system is so wonderful is because there's an insane amount of diversity in antibody structure. A lot of that comes from recombining DNA and making changes to it in B cells that will then generate different antibodies. So this quick and dirty mechanism for repairing DNA seems to have been co-opted in vertebrate immunity for generating antibody diversity. So repairing and also generating diversity. So, but again, this is the, the quick and dirty mechanism which can cause um, a number of problems. And in fact, the reason that radiation oncology works is because you get so many double-stranded breaks with radiation, and those all get repaired by this non-homologous end joining mechanism, which messes up genes so the cell dies. That's the basic premise, then, of, of radiation oncology. <clears throat> On the other hand, if you don't want to mess up that part of your genome where you've had a double-stranded break, homologous recombination is a much safer way to deal with this. So what you have in rec homologous recombination, first you have a double-stranded break, and then after you've had this double-stranded break, then there's degradation of this, these two double strands, leaving a 3' prime overhang. So 3' prime OH, and then the 5' prime phosphate is in here. Both of these happen. So you have exonuclease activity that will break these down. Then you have a process called strand invasion, and this is where the homologous part comes in. Homologous, again, similar ancestor, but means it's got similar sequences. So this green DNA can now base pair with this red DNA if you have the appropriate proteins around to help this process. And we'll see what those are in just a second. So strand invasion, now we have this three prime end, that's bound to the homologous chromosome. Now you've got a 3' OH and a template. What happens to 3' OHs and templates? We've got DNA polymerases, will, which will extend. In this process, moving this extra displaced piece of DNA along here until you get to a point past where the break was that this DNA can now base pair over here. Once it base pairs over here, this 3' OH has a template. It can extend as well. So you end up with DNA polymerases, which are extending through. Eventually, we'll get to the point where this end is opposite this end, where you'd had your degradation that takes place. These get ligated to each other. And then you have something called a holiday junction that we'll look at in more detail, and then this resolution, which is cutting these two strands and ligating them back together. Now you end up with a repaired double-strand break here, and the genetic source of this repaired DNA is here, in this case, from the red or maternal chromosomes. So let's look at these individual steps here. The first step that happens is that three prime extension 
it has to undergo strand invasion. Just those three prime extensions by themselves are not going to be able to undergo strand invasion. They need to bind to another protein. That protein in E. coli is called Rec A. Why is it called Rec A? Because you have mutations in it, you have defects in recombination. Now, Rec A is important for lots and lots of different things in E. coli, but um, this mechanism is the first one they found for recombination. So Rec A binds to DNA and needs to hydrolyze ATP in order to get this binding. And that also makes sense because you're only going to want to have this process take place when you really want to undergo homologous recombination. So once you have Rec A bound single-stranded DNA, that can then get into a DNA duplex that's normally double-stranded and exchange this single-stranded DNA, now in gray, for the orange DNA, which was here. So these are all now bound together. You have ATP hydrolysis. ATP hydrolysis, again, a change in the structure of our Rec A. That's lost. And you have the strand exchange process that takes place. This has actually been very well studied also from an X-ray crystallography point of view. This is Rec A bound to single-stranded DNA. The eukaryotic equivalent of this is RAD51. Why RAD? Because it's sensitive to irradiation, because it doesn't repair double-stranded breaks as well. So um, RAD51 is the homolog of Rec A and serves really nicely um, in the more or less exactly the same way. So you start out here, input DNAs, here's your single-stranded piece, the red one, double-stranded piece, Rec A or Rec 51 associates with that single strand. Then after you have ATP hydrolysis dissociation of Rec A, you've now had this strand exchange process. The single-stranded DNA, the red one, has now displaced this one right here. So that's that strand invasion process. That strand invasion process has actually been studied extremely well by, among other people, Dr. Justin Corsell over in SRTC in the basement. Um, but <clears throat> he looks at DNA replication and how you get this process of DNA replication when you have mistakes, and what are the roles of all of these rec proteins in that process. So, sort of mentioned this already, but diploids are great for homologous recombination because we've got that sister chromatid, right? Mom's information, so dad's information falls apart, you got mom's information to repair it. But if you're haploid, like E. coli, where's that extra information coming from? Well, it turns out extra information is coming from newly replicated DNA. And it turns out that newly replicated DNA is right next to where double-stranded breaks often form. So if you have a nick in the DNA, and when I say a nick, that's just literally a break, like we actually have here in our model, in the DNA backbone between the phosphates and the sugars. So if you have a nick, a break there, when the DNA polymerase comes along, it will come along, hit this nick in one strand, and now you have a double-stranded break. Fortunately, because this is just undergo replication, this is right next to a homologous DNA sequence. And so this homologous recombination can happen right here, Deg uh, degradation of your 5' prime end, you've got your 3' prime overhang, Rec A interacts with this, you have strand invasion, you have new synthesis, form holiday junctions, etc., and your, <clears throat> excuse me, get your homologous recombination taking place. So this is what's happening in most bacterial cells. Eukaryotic cells, you have radiation, but those of you who are taking genetics, and I know there are a few of you here, um, will also remember that in meiosis, you have crossing over between sister chromatids, homologous chromosomes. What's that? It's homologous recombination. How does that happen? Well, it turns out that the way that meiotic recombination happens 
is instead of there being a random double-stranded break that happens, there are actually proteins that are active in meiosis which will cut one of the strands of DNA and generate a double-stranded break. And that double-stranded break will get repaired by homologous recombination. And so double-stranded breaks happen in meiosis. And we'll see how that leads to crossing over here in just a second. So these are the proteins that are involved. Again, the names are not important, but they bind to one of the chromosomes, make a double-stranded break, and will chew in the 5' prime end, giving you a 3' prime overhang. These are eukaryotic cells, so it's RAD51 that undergoes strand exchange, and then you have extension of each of these 3' OHs and strand displacement that takes place. Um, I'll talk about what's here on the other side in, in just a second. Well, actually, why don't we talk about it now? Uh, this is what happens in meiosis, you know, homologous chromosomes, duplication of meiosis. You have crossing over where you end up with some red and some blue, but you also have a number of locations of what's called gene conversion. And so gene conversion here is where you have information from one chromosome that has then gotten put onto the other chromosome, so the alleles. In this case, if we'll just call the red your maternal and the blue the paternal, you'll have some paternal alleles that end up on the otherwise maternal chromosome and Sometimes you have the crossing over where you end up with the paternal chromosome hooked up to the maternal chromosome. How does that actually happen? So that brings us to these holiday junctions. So after you have strand invasion, you have extension by the DNA polymerase, these ends get hooked together. So here's your extension. This is going to be your 3' OH. Here's your 5' prime phosphate. Ligase ligates that together. You end up with this crossing over structure. And here at the other end as well. So these, each of these structures is called a holiday junction. Once you have a holiday junction and your DNA is you know, crossed over like this, particularly if you've got chromosomes, and you're trying to undergo meiosis, you don't want to pull those two chromosomes to opposite sides of the cell. Again, you're trying to generate your germ cells. Well, if they're crossed over like this, that's not going to happen. And the same thing is true when you have homologous recombination. You have the, this crossover between the chromosomes. So somehow that's got to get chopped apart so these two things can be moved apart. That's the so-called holiday junction resolvase. And holiday junction resolvases can cut in two different ways. And so that's what's shown here. Holiday junction resolvases can cut basically in what looks like the top here, and this strand would get hooked up to this strand, and here cut across from each other, so this strand gets hooked up to that strand. And in this process, if you have a, what we see here, a vertical cutting and religating versus a horizontal cutting and religating, what this is going to do is, if you just trace along here, so this is cut and ligated here, this is cut and ligated here, now you have a chromosome that has information at one end, which has come from one of our homologous chromosomes, and the other end is not. If, however, you have cutting in the same way, cutting and ligating here, so this piece gets ligated to that piece, this case gets ligated to that piece, you end up with what we call a patch or a non-crossover. Turns out that at least as far as the biochemistry is concerned, these guys can happen just as frequently. We end up with a crossover or a non-crossover. There are regulatory mechanisms in meiosis which say you end up with at least one of these crossovers and some that don't have these crossovers. And so this process here where you have the information, the information in the middle here where you've repaired your double-stranded break, all this green stuff, that's now all of the information that you got from your 
red chromosome, we'll continue to call it the maternal chromosome here. So right where you have this is going to be one chromosome, but you'll also have regions of the genome where you have two different sequences here. So in this case, it's heteroduplex with our orange and our red. And we'll um, take a look at that here. What that leads to is a potential gene conversion event. But first, I want to look at holiday junctions in a little bit more detail. Back up here. I'll get to the clicker question in just a second. It's in the wrong place. Um, so <clears throat> here, this cutting and religating, and why cutting here in the middle is just like cutting on the outside, it is actually identical from the point of view of proteins. Because if you look at a holiday junction, DNA isn't just like straight lines like this. DNA is wrapped around each other. And so a better way to look at holiday junctions is this. So if you expand them and actually literally look at them either in the electron microscope, which is what you can see in this micrograph right here, or modeled, a holiday junction really looks like this, where you have this strand attached over here, this strand attached over here, and these constant strands in the background. So this is a really symmetrical structure. Again, it doesn't look like it when you draw them as the horizontal lines and one of them crossed over. But if you think about it in a double-stranded wrapped form, these are completely equivalent to each other. And I prefer to look at it again in this sort of open form. This is a different way of looking at this process. And so here, hopefully it's pretty obvious, cutting and religating here is equivalent to cutting and religating here because it's completely symmetrical. And the proteins really don't know which one is which. So cutting and religating one way, cutting and religating the other way. Again, 50-50 chance. And so you can end up with a crossover or a patch in the process. Another thing that I forgot to mention is that once you have these holiday junctions, where you've got basically you know, four strands of DNA coming together, there's something called branch migration that can happen. Now, what's branch migration? Branch migration is basically this holiday junction moving relative to the sequence back and forth. And again, this is you know, completely symmetric. And this is our structure that we have right here in the middle. This structure, if you break one base pair that you have here, you're going to be forming a base pair over here. You break a base pair here, you're forming a base pair here. And that's actually animated quite nicely here, where <clears throat> people have looked at what happens when you have a holiday junction migration. So here we have two strands. They start out being purple and green. In this holiday junction migration complex, this will be transferred again, breaking base pairs here, forming base pairs here. So you can actually get branch migration that can literally move thousands of base pairs once you have this holiday junction that's formed. You know, back and forth relative to where you had this <clears throat> exchange that took place before. Um, and there's, there are more images on this site. I, I put the link in the, the PowerPoint so you can take a look at those in more detail as you like. Oh yeah, this, this is the, the link for this process. Okay, so now I'm finally going to ask you that clicker question. Sorry I um, got that out of order. but So here we are. Where is it? Um, after a double-stranded break in DNA, what is required before strand invasion can take place? 5' prime to 3' prime endonuclease, 3' prime to 5' prime endonuclease, 5' prime to 3' prime exonuclease, 3' prime to 5' prime exonuclease, or holiday junction resolution, which is cutting and religating. Five. 
Okay, we're nowhere near a consensus on this one, so I think you need to talk to your neighbors. <laughs> Okay, we ready to go again? Yes, no, <laughs> no, no, lots of shaking heads. No, no, yes, no. Five prime, three prime, three prime, five prime, endo, exo, <laughs> flail, flail. Super coiling. Look, look, look at super coils. See, it's super coils. <laughs> That's what these are for. Okay, let's do this. Again, continue to discuss. This is fine. I have another 50 seconds. And it's the last click that you make that counts. So just pound that button. <laughs> Okay, well, at least a lot of people have a consensus on this. So it's, what's endonuclease? Endonuclease is cutting in the middle of your DNA. So it can't be an endonuclease because it's after the double-stranded break. Okay, so we're down to exonucleases and holiday junction resolutions. Nobody liked holiday junction resolutions. It's that extra one that I threw in there. So 5 prime to 3 prime or 3 prime to 5 prime. Those are our two options, right? So what's the end which you A, have to have, because that's where your DNA polymerase is going to be, and B, undergoes strand invasion. What end is that? It's a three prime end, right? So to get that three prime end, you've got to chew up the other strand. How do you do that? You go from five prime to three prime, because you're getting rid of that five prime end. So yes, it is C. Again, if in doubt, pick C for Stedman's questions. I need to do a better job of that. <laughs> Okay, so <clears throat> one of the things about, um, and I sort of emphasize this, the patches and then also to some extent the crossing over that takes place. And always after you have branch migration, you're going to have some information from a maternal chromosome and some from a paternal chromosome. If those sequences are different, you're going to end up with some mismatched DNA, 
because, you know, one will be one nucleotide on one strand and one will be a different nucleotide on the other strand. Um, this is now a clear mismatch. Mismatch repair happens. After this mismatch repair, you're going to chop out one of the strands, you're going to resynthesize it. And so wherever you've got information from maternal and paternal that's different as far as having homologous recombination, that will get repaired. And at this point, we don't know which of those is the new strand and which of those is the old strand. So it ends up being about 50% of the time for one and 50% of the time for the other, because there's no difference between the two. So <clears throat> that, what that happens is it leads to this process called gene conversion. And gene conversion is when you see maternal and paternal alleles not be nicely segregated. So Mendel was wrong in this case. These are some of the exceptions to Mendel's rules, because you end up with more alleles from one parent versus the other parent. Um, but it's only in these regions where you've had homologous recombination that's taken place. So gene conversion is one of the things that can happen, and it's an outcome of this process of homologous recombination because those two chromosomes are actually not identical to each other. So just a, a process of that. So it's it's pretty good, but sometimes you'll have this gene conversion process that takes place. A couple of other sort of minor things I wanted to talk about in terms of DNA repair, which we'll probably just finish up with today. I'd love to talk about transposons, but it's about to snow, so we'll probably stop doing that. So um, just finish up talking about translesion polymerases. So um, translesion polymerases, this is what happens in the cell when the going gets really bad. Um, lots of DNA damage has happened, but still you want to make sure that your genome gets replicated. So this, these are specific DNA polymerases. They're induced by some kind of cellular stress that happens, and there's lots of different ways that this can happen. Usually it's a process where you have lots of DNA damage that's happened. And when you have lots of DNA damage, one of the first things that happens, at least in E. coli, is you turn on Rec A. And the process how you turn on Rec A, I think we talk about mostly in virology next term. But be that as it may, stressful situation, you turn on Rec A. Again, usually because you've got lots of DNA damage. And what happens is DNA, um, this DNA damage, or whatever the stress is, causes cell division to be stopped and these error-prone polymerases to be made. So what are these error-prone polymerases? What these error-prone polymerases are is it's another way for the cell to deal with having some kind of DNA damage that's happened, but still finish your replication. Because you know, if you've got lots and lots of DNA damage, you've completely blocked DNA replication, you could have all kinds of other problems that happen to the cell. So it turns out that finishing replication and then going back and dealing with all of the DNA damage is a better way to go. But how do you deal with the fact that we have a normal DNA polymerase that hits this DNA damage? It doesn't know what to do. Say it's got a runs into a pyrimidine dimer, a classic here, or some other kind of DNA damage, and this replicating DNA polymerase can't do anything. So what happens is, runs into one of these problems, and then the sliding clamp will stop here, and this DNA polymerase will be removed, then a translesion, or also known as error-prone polymerase, will bind to the sliding clamp, and it will put in whatever nucleotides across from where you had that DNA damage. And then once it's gone through here, this actually dissociates. It's not a very processive. It does interact very well with the PCNA, the sliding clamp. And then you have a 3 prime OH, a sliding clamp, a template. Your replicative DNA polymerase can come in and finish replication. And then hopefully your DNA repair machinery will come along and repair all of those problems later on. So this is a process 
where, again, you can have DNA polymerases, and these are now very low fidelity DNA polymerases. They put in a lot of the wrong nucleotides because they don't necessarily know what nucleotides to put in. It's just some kind of DNA damage. We just got to get past that DNA damage. As long as we get past the DNA damage, we can continue and we'll be okay. So you don't want these polymerases to be processive. If they were processive, they'd be putting in all kinds of wrong nucleotides, and so you'd end up with all kinds of problems you'd have to deal with with mismatch repair. So this is just another way of looking at this. Um, this is the case in E. coli. You've got the beta sliding clamp, um, our normal DNA polymerase 3, different polymerases. You may have wondered why we had DNA polymerase 1 and DNA polymerase 3. Some of these other DNA polymerases, DNA polymerase 4, DNA polymerase 5, these are these translesion or error prone polymerases that will put in whatever nucleotides and then hope that DNA repair mechanisms will deal with this. This is just the crystal structure of one of these um, translesion polymerases here. So what do we talk about today? Repair wise, um, in fact actually what we talked about last time, uh, mutations um, and particularly human diseases of DNA repair proteins, which have very high rates of cancer because these mutations are going to end up leading to cancer. So we see lots of issues with that. We've got very specific repair mechanisms that will either be your proofreading mechanism from your DNA polymerase, your mismatch repair, as long as it's coupled with replication, that will put in and repair that new strand, and photoreactivation because it recognizes permitting dimers. And I, this should actually be over here as a specific repair. Basic space repair, this is what happens when you have very common mutations and an enzyme that will specifically cut out one nucleotide. On the other hand, lots of changes, particularly in organisms that don't have photoreactivation, you've got structural changes that will give us nucleotide excision repair, double-stranded break repair, quick and dirty non-homologous end joining, homologous recombination, or at the very end, translesion synthesis. A clicker question, or do you want to go home? Clicker? clicker? Okay, let's do a clicker question. Go, talk about it. Which of the following DNA re repair mechanisms cause gene conversion? Mismatch repair, basic excision repair, nucleotide excision mm -hmm. repair, non-homologous end joining, air-prone polymerases. We have another minute left of class, so I'll give you another minute. Go ahead and vote again. Make sure you vote again. And the answer is mismatch repair. Have a good weekend. Again, if there's no class on Monday, I will be recording and posting a lecture, or Wednesday, or Friday, as for that matter. <laughs>